Sonic, the heart of your system. Alright guys, Dominic here for KitGuru and today we are looking at another aftermarket RTX 2080. This is the Asus ROG Strix RTX 2080 OC. So this card is nothing short of a monster and that is both in terms of its physical size but also in terms of its feature set and price. The reason we're talking about price is because this card is £999.95 here in the UK which makes it uh, the most expensive RTX 2080 you can currently buy. It's also worth mentioning that it does come factory overclocked. Out of the box, it ships at 1860 megahertz, although using GPU to tweak two, you can up this to 1890 megahertz, and that is how we did our testing, but more on that later. Starting first with a look at the design though, there is definitely a lot of similarities between this Strix card and the previous Asus ROG Strix cards from the GTX 10 series for instance. For one you've got the all black plastic shroud on the front which has got the same sort of angular kind of ridged look to it which is again just like we saw on the previous generation and of course it's another triple fan cooling setup. There are a few differences though and the first thing we're going to start off is actually size. This is a 2.7 slot card whereas the previous generation of Strix cards were 2.5 slot. If you're interested in the full dimensions of this card it measures 29.97 centimeters by 13.04 centimeters by 5.41 centimeters. So it's almost 30 centimeters long so definitely make sure this card is going to fit in your case and as we mentioned it is extra thick compared to the previous generation. We'll see shortly that a lot of this thickness is due to the increased size of the heatsink, but more on that later. Back to the front of the card though, the fans have actually changed from previous generation. These ones have been redesigned compared to the previous generation of Strix cards. Asus calls these axial tech fans when the previous generation of fan was called wing blade fans. What's new with the axial tech fans is that the blade design is much more swept, whereas the wing blade design was a lot flatter and a lot straighter. And you can also see there is now a ring around the outside of the fans, kind of enclosing them somewhat, whereas the previous wing blade design was a lot more open. In sum, Asus claims these changes, the new Axial Tech fans, result in an increase of 27% extra airflow compared to the wing blade generation and an extra 40% static pressure. We'll look at thermals later on in the review. This front of the shroud is also home to the Asus Aura RGB lighting. It's pretty much the same configuration as last generation. So you've got 12 small LED strips on the front of the card and then there's also the Asus ROG logo on the back plate and then a small ROG logo on the front side of the card and all these three areas are configurable using Asus or RGB lighting software. Speaking of the front side of the card, there is some subtle GeForce RTX branding there, but I think more interestingly is the fact that there is a dual BIOS switch. This is something we usually see from high-end cards. They usually give you a reference clock BIOS and then an overclock BIOS. But Asus is doing something different with this Strix 2080 in the fact that one bias is called performance mode and the other is called quiet mode. So essentially all that changes is actually the fan curve. So in performance mode we will get slightly higher fan speeds thus greater noise whereas the quiet mode will drastically reduce fan speed to reduce noise. It is important to note that the different BIOS only change the fan curve, the actual clock speed remains consistent between the two different modes. However, as we know that GPU frequency is now very much linked to GPU temperature, it will be interesting to measure how much performance difference the two fan curves actually make later on in the review. Now flipping over to the back of the card and the back plate, we can see it's a lovely brush metal finished, I think it looks really good. There's the Asus ROG logo that we already mentioned which acts as one of the RGB lighting zones. And then there's also some kind of white lines just to add a bit of interest, a bit of extra design to the back of the card. Interestingly, something new here is actually a master LED power switch. So simply put, you push this button and it will turn the LED lighting on or off. I can appreciate this is obviously Asus kind of going for the people who don't like RGB. It's an easy way just to completely kill it. You don't have to download the software or anything like that. However, I can't help but feel it is perhaps slightly impractical. You're not really going to want to take your case off and on every time you want to push the button. So in that regard, maybe using the software is easier. But if you just install it in your case, turn it on, 
push the button, completely kill the LEDs, and if you're not gonna turn the Mac on, it might be useful for you, but it's certainly a new feature for this generation of Strix cards. On the end of the card as well, it's worth pointing out there are three four pin headers here. We did see this on the previous generation, but two of those headers are for controlling case fans using the GPU. So instead of having your case fan ramp up according to CPU temperature, it will actually ramp up according to GPU temperature, which should help keep your GPU cool by providing with extra airflow. The other header is actually a four pin RGB header. So this lets you connect a compatible RGB strip or an RGB fan or whatever RGB thing you might want to add. And that'll let you have it all controlled within Asus Aura so you can have your LED strip, for instance, perfectly synchronized with your new graphics card. I do have to call Asus out for this multicolor cable at the end of the card though. This is for the graphics card's own fans. But I think it's just ridiculous that at £999, this is a really ugly multicolor cabling. I don't see why it couldn't just be black. It's obviously a minor point for sure, but when you're paying this much money and considering it's actually exposed at the end of the card, it's not like it's hidden or tucked away. I really think Asus needs to be making this an all black cable. As I said, it's a very minor point, but when you're spending this much money, it does look just a little bit lazy. Moving on though, and in terms of power requirements, the 2080 Strix does require two eight pins. This is obviously up from the one times eight pin and one times six pin from the founders edition. So slightly increased power requirements there. The display outputs have also been changed. So the Strix will give you two DisplayPort 1.4 ports and then two HDMI 2.0B ports as well as the USB-C. So compared to founders, that's one less DisplayPort and one extra HDMI port. Moving on to card disassembly though, it's actually very easy to remove remove the heatsink from the PCB. You just need to remove six screws from the back of the card and then the heatsink will pop off. That's not quite the end of the story though. As you can see, there's this metal frame which is actually screwed onto the PCB itself. This is both to add extra rigidity to the card and prevent any sagging in your case. While we can also see there's actually thermal pads on this little metal frame which connect with the VRAM chips. So in that regard, it kind of acts as a little heatsink as well for those VRAM chips. Removing this frame is another few screws and then finally we get access to the bare PCB. Interestingly here we can see straight away that Asus has upped the power phase design. It was 8 plus 2 power phase design on the Founders Edition and Asus has increased this to a 10 plus 2 design using its Super Alloy Power or SAP design which it has used for this new generation of Strix cards. Another thing we can see is actually there's a lot more capacitors than we saw on the Founders Edition and Asus claims these have an extra 90,000 hours lifespan compared to traditional capacitors. Although obviously we can't quite test that in this review. Moving on to the memory, this again comes from Micron. It's eight gigabytes of GDR6. And then we can also see that the GPU die is labeled TU104-400A. And as we've already covered, that A simply means this is a bin chip, which Nvidia has said is suitable for a factory overclock. And we already mentioned that this card does ship with a factory overclock out of the box. Now in terms of the heatsink, this uses six nickel plated copper heat pipes and the actual heft of the aluminium fin stack has actually been increased to have 20% greater surface area than the previous generation of Strix cards. And obviously this just means extra space to dissipate more heat from the card. The GPU itself contacts with a nickel plated copper base and this actually uses Asus's Max Contact technology, which is something we saw introduced on the previous generation. Asus claims it's actually 10 times flatter than other traditional heat spreaders, which thus enables greater contact and thus greater heat dissipation. And as mentioned, we are gonna to touch on thermals later on in the review. The last thing to note though, is we can see there is a thermal pad for the MOSFETs, and this is actually on the aluminum fin stack itself. It's not got a separate cold plate for those MOSFETs. So that means the heat of the MOSFETs is being transferred into the entire body of the aluminum fin stack, which again should help sufficiently cool that VRM and the MOSFETs. Moving on now, so in terms of performance, we already mentioned that the Strix runs at 1860 MHz out of the box. However, if you download GPU Tweak 2, you can enable the OC mode. This adds an extra 30 MHz, so the card runs at 1890 MHz boost clock, and this is how we did our testing. We also tested using both the quiet and the performance modes to see what difference they make, and each one is clearly labeled on the graph, so you know which is which. So then moving on to 3D Mark and our games testing, we can see that in performance mode, the Strix 2080 is actually the fastest 2080 card we have tested so far. 
While we say it's the fastest, the gap isn't huge. In fact, the biggest difference at 4K was just 1.6 FPS between the Strix and the Founds Edition, but nonetheless, it is still the fastest. Interestingly, the Quiet Bias is actually very, very fast as well. We're going to touch on the benefits of that in just a moment, but it's interesting to see it still manages to beat out or perform just on par as other aftermarket 2080 cars we've seen from the likes of Gigabyte and Pallet. What you do gain from the Quiet Bias, however, is just fantastically low noise levels. There's no other way to put it. It peaked at just under 39 decibels, which is a brilliant result. In performance mode, it is a bit louder. You can hear it, but in quiet mode, I actually had to put my ear right up against the fans just to make sure they were actually emitting some noise. In a case, I really think you'd struggle to hear it as it is just so quiet. As expected, the much quieter fan curve does mean GPU temperatures are higher when testing in quiet mode. We saw the GPU core peak at 73C in the quiet BIOS, whereas performance BIOS saw the GPU peak at just 62C, which is a full 13 degrees Celsius cooler than the Founders Edition. That peak of 73C for the card in quiet mode is still 2 degrees cooler than the Founders Edition though, so it is again still a fantastic result considering how quiet the card was actually running. Now, as the card in quiet mode was running hotter, this does mean that the average clock speed was slightly lower. We saw it reach almost 1940 MHz, although this is still actually a lot faster than other aftermarket cards we've seen, and only 24 MHz behind the card when running in performance mode. So that really just goes to show the card is significantly quieter when running in quiet mode. However, you really don't lose that much in terms of clock speed. Now, moving on to power consumption, as you know, we do have dedicated hardware with sensors in the PCIe slot and the PCIe power cables, which lets us measure graphics card only power draw. So looking at the results, we can see there was very little between the quiet BIOS and the performance BIOS. However, the Strix is still drawing about 35 watts more than the Founders Edition, but this is only about another 10 to 15 watts over other aftermarket cards we've seen, and is really nothing to be concerned about. Moving on now to overclocking, I was actually really impressed with what the Strix card could handle. We did our overclocking with the BIOS mode set to the performance mode. Uh, this was purely so thermals wouldn't be an issue. And what we could do is actually add an extra 110 megahertz to the GPU core, which remember was already running at 1890 MHz. We were also able to add 700 megahertz to the GDR6 memory. This saw us break past 30,000 points in 3D Mark Firestrike, and we also gained an extra 3PS when playing Far Cry 5 at 4K resolution. Temperatures only rose just one degree actually when running the card while overclocked, and this is actually a fantastic result. And as we will see shortly, the frequency actually managed to hit almost 2.1 gigahertz, which was the average sustained clock speed under load, as it was running just over 2,070 megahertz. This did cause power door to jump up an extra 22 watts, meaning the Strix card was drawing almost 300 watts while overclocked. However, if you are spending this much money on a single graphics card, it is unlikely to bother you. So then, wrapping up the review, I have to say the Strix is the finest aftermarket RTX 2080 card I have tested so far. You get the benefit from the aggressive factory overclock, which actually makes this the fastest RTX 2080 we've tested yet but you also really benefit from the dual BIOS implementation. That's because it actually makes a very significant difference to total noise output. The quiet BIOS mode is just fabulously quiet and it actually doesn't run very much slower at all compared to the performance BIOS mode. On top of that, the card not only looks good, but also comes with plenty of RGB lighting. You can completely turn it off if you want using the master switch. And there's also the benefit of those extra headers on the end of the card. The problem is, of course, pricing. This card costs £999.95, so it's £1,000 basically. Not only is that £250 more than a Founders Edition RTX 2080, but it's only £100 less than an RTX 2080 Ti. What that means is, if you're going to spend £1,000 on a graphics card, you only need to stump up an extra 10% and you'd be able to get a 2080 Ti with the significant bump in performance that that would bring over the 2080. Now, Asus ROG products have always been expensive, but I think this Strix at £999.95 is really taking things to another level, considering that is £250 more than a Founders Edition 2080 and only £100 less than a Founders Edition 2080 Ti. It really puts this Strix in an impossible position. So, while it is undoubtedly the finest RTX 2080 card we have reviewed so far, 
it is very hard to recommend purely because if you're spending this much money, you really should just spend that bit extra and get a 2080 Ti. So I'm Dominic for Kikiru. I've been reviewing this Asus Strix RTX 2080. Let us know what you think. Would you be prepared to spend this much extra on a aftermarket RTX 2080 card or is the pricing just completely ridiculous? Let us know down in the comments. Make sure you hit that subscribe button as well. We've got more aftermarket 2080 cards and 2080 Ti cards coming very, very soon. I would also love you to hit that notification bell as well so you get notified about all of those upcoming videos. Until then though, I will see you in the next video.